Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to your Critique of the Week for uh, Friday, August 26th. So glad you could join me. Um, um, as always, the uh, goal of the critique is to give that workshop experience to everybody uh, right in the comfort of your own home and for free. We all sit around and look at some poems, share and enjoy, uh, learn some things. So give as much feedback as you can. As we read these in the chat windows on Facebook and YouTube, I will pass as long as many comments as I can, but the poets can look at the, uh, the, uh, the comments too. So leave as many comments as you can. Let us know what you think, what works, what doesn't, any suggestions you might have as we go through these, these four poems. Um, you know, regular viewers know every week we look at uh, two poets and two poems each is the norm. If you'd like to participate and have your poems critiqued, all you have to do is go to Submittable. That is uh, Rattle's Submittable page. Um, go to uh, rattle.com and click on submissions, and you'll see a category for Critique of the Week. That category, um, um, submit two poems there, and then I draw them at random out of a hat. You'll have a few days of uh, warning if I, if I pick your name or when I eventually do. So that is how you participate. Um, now, if you notice, I have a little cut on my forehead right there. Um, I wish I had a good story about it, but the truth is I walked into a wall. <laughs> I was tucking in. Uh, Colin turned out the lights like I do every night. Then I tripped over the cat. Uh, somehow that like made me lose sense of where I was in the room. And um, instead of turning around the corner, I walked straight into the corner. So that was my night last night. Blood dripping down my face. But uh, it's all good now. It looks like a battle wound, a poetry battle wound or something. Um, anyway, so just ignore that. Um, and let's continue and, and start with the uh, actual critique. We have two poets today, and uh, it looks like good poems. I, I gave a little sneak peek, but we'll see what we've got. Um, and here we go. This is the first poem. Oops, there we go. Um, these are poems by, um, uh, the name's on the bottom, Annie Wilcox. There are two poems by Annie Wilcox. Um, Portrait of a Prisoner. On entry day. Number 59118's mugshot screams from his school badge like a snitch with bad ink that a no-good crip capped a brother. His reason, it never leaves him alone. His excuse sometimes gets lost on the classroom carpet to be stepped on repeatedly, then found and later lurks waiting for him to reluctantly retrieve it from the lament laminated central control desk where radio chatter crackles loudly Sounding like you know what. Defiantly, he finger flicks it so it sails away only to land in a corner on the cold cement floor where it is soon found by another J.O. Brick hard boy, petrified heart, cocky and cold, reason sulks. A few years later, it is Tuesday. Number 59118 hunkers down with pent up pride and colorful candor in the noisy classroom, sweating over sweating over syllables and words like irony and conundrum. He jumps up, nods in reverse, down then up, with the jaw winking and winking at teacher knowingly, because he is one, a puzzled prisoner. His liquid laughter sprays the classroom, and all the boys look at 59118's face that is now shining and lighting up those green eyes so they glow and his dreadlocks sing as he shakes them about. A grin wider than the Mississippi snakes across his face and never leaves. Understanding irony and conundrum has killed what is left of reason today. Something to celebrate inside. Something to celebrate. So that is uh, today's, today's first poem, Portrait of a Prisoner. And um, so, so first of all, you know, the title leads us into the poem. So it's a working title. Um, it's titled that... that you know, works well um, in a table of contents. You just be a little curious about that poem, I think. Um, Portrait of a Prisoner. It's got a little alliteration, too. It's a nice title. Um, I think I think the title's fine. On entry day, number 59118's mugshot screams from the school badge like a snitch with bad ink that a no-good crip capped, his, capped a brother. So that is the first, uh, the first line here. The number, this, this number is written out, and everywhere else, this is the kind of thing maybe editors notice, but, but that's something, I, I try to, uh, when, when just um, copy editing for Rattle, um, you know, I try to make things internally consistent. Like, I let poets do whatever they want to do. Like, they make the decisions that they want to make for about how they want to format things, and their comma usage and punctuation, as long as it's consistent through the poem. That's the one thing we look for. 
Um, and so since it's uh, written out as a pound, you know, number symbol here and everywhere else in the poem, I would change that to a number. Um, and then since you do that, that shortens the line, so maybe, you know, bring the line up or something. Um, an entry day, number 59118's mugshot screams from his school badge like a snitch with bad ink. Uh, that are no good crip, capped a brother. I think this is a little, to me this feels a little, um, I don't know what the word is, a little cliched or something, way of saying this. I liked it up to the ink part. Uh, no good crip, capping a brother. It's a little like, um, I don't know, it, it feels a little inauthentic. Uh, there's another way, uh, something more original and unique um, way of saying that. Maybe not, but that's how it strikes me. It's kind of a, a cliche of like of how you would put that, or, or maybe dated is more more what I'm thinking. But I think they could could come up with a better way to say that. Um, his reason never leaves him. Again, there was another con inconsistency here where we capitalize reason down here. Um, reason, um, you know, that's uh, personified, but not here. And so I would keep that consistent too. Um, his reason. It never leaves him alone. So I love the, the bluntness of this statement. Um, you know, we get this, uh, we know what's the setup is, then we sort of roll into the poem of the story, and then we get this slowdown right here, his reason. It never leaves him alone. There's something really nice about, um, um, there's something really nice about the, the way that it slows you down and stops at that point, I think. There's a good sense of rhythm here. His excuse sometimes his excuse sometimes gets lost in the classroom carpet to be stepped on repeatedly, then found, and later lurks waiting for him to reluctantly retrieve it. Um, I think reluctantly is maybe a little too uh, too much. I'd probably cut reluctantly. Um, just because we're it's a really great image that you know the excuse is getting lost in the carpet and then having to retrieve it. The reluctantly retrieve it sort of stretches it out in a way where the image, I think, sta stands alone a little bit better. So I would uh, probably cut that. From the lamented central control desk where radio chatter crackles loudly, sounding like you know what. And again, I like that too. I think that's a good... Yeah, you know, these are just a great entry into the story. Defiantly, he finger flicks it so it sails away, only to land in a corner on the cold cement floor where it is soon found by another J.O., Brick hard boy, petrified heart, cocky and cold, reason sulks. Maybe the reason that's capital is because that should be a period there and it's missing. Um, I'm not sure. Reason sulks. A few years later, a few years later, it is Tuesday. Number five nine one one eight hunkers down with pent up pride and colorful candor in the noisy classroom, sweating over. Um, sweating over syllables and spelling words like irony and conundrum. He jumps up, nods in reverse, then down, then up with a jaw, winking and winking at teacher knowingly because he is one, a puzzled prisoner. I think this is where the poem really comes to life in this, this section here. And the descriptions are so good. Um, and the story is so compelling and interesting. Um, you know, the... To, to the, have that to be, I am a puzzled prisoner. I think it's a great, a great little anecdote to be telling. It's a really fun story um, with a lot of, a lot, a lot of like to unpack within it, you know. And then once that it comes to be about the story, the descriptions be really great. It's liquid laughter sprays the classroom, and all the boys look at five nine one one eight's face that is now shining and lighting up those green eyes so they glow. And as dreadlock sings, he snakes them about. It's what great descriptions. Like we're all there in this section of the poem. Um, a grin wider than the Mississippi snakes across his face. Um, did we use snake before? No, I don't think so. Um, a grin wider than the Mississippi snakes across his face and never leaves. That's just a great story. This whole this whole section I like a lot. Understanding irony and conundrum has killed what is left of reason today. Something to celebrate inside. Something to celebrate. So I think the uh, the repetition at the end... Um, it feels a little melodramatic to repeat it like that. I think it's better just to end with a something to celebrate inside, or maybe just something to celebrate. Um, let's see. So Dick Westheimer says, uh, might change it to uh, Portrait of a Juvenile Offender. 
I was confused at first, he says. And yeah, I, th I was wondering about that too. Um, because it's clear it is a, it's a juvenile um, hall or whatever they call it. And, um, and so, but, but it is a prisoner. It's an interesting question. I mean, I, I, um, he did, uh, there's something interesting about shifting your expectations from an adult into a, a child as you go through. Um, so I think that kind of creates a transition a little bit in your mind because you're thinking at the very beginning when you say on entry day number 59118, you're thinking adult. Or at least I am. And then you slowly realize it's a kid. And I think that works. I don't think, I don't know, I don't think I would change that. But but if anybody else has any comments. Um, Deborah T says the same thing. Portrait of a juvenile prisoner or juvenile offender. Um, is that what J-O means? A, a J-O is a juvenile offender? I was wondering what that was. That's something I didn't didn't recognize. Um, or a young prisoner, says Deborah T. I kind of like that sense of movement. Let's see. Nate Jacobs says, I really like that irony and conundrum are killers of reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and a very appropriate poem, too, for this week. It was just a coincidence. But we had the um, Prisoner Express issue. And, um, you know, talking about the prison is a crazy making place. And today's poem of the day is another um, a poet in prison. Um, let's see. Yeah, Beth Monal Anderson says very strong poem. Joe Barker says, could a word be used as substitute for liquid? Um, where was the liquid? Um, I can't remember where the liquid was. Um, hmm, I can't find it now. Uh, irony, words, bubble, no way. Oh, liquid laughter. There it is. Man, it's hard to pick out words from a, from a lineup. <laughs> His liquid laughter. I kind of like the liquid laughter because it, um, it, you know, it's actually a spray. It's like, um, and there's got the alliteration, liquid laughter. I kind of like that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if I would change that, actually. It is. It's one of those words that we use a lot. Um, Kelly Rush has an interesting poem, maybe delete cold before cement. Cement suggests cold. Yeah, that's a good point, too. You know, anytime you can cut up clutter and, and, and remove words that are unnecessary, and I'm going to have trouble finding that again, too. Cement. It was down the first page, right? Cement. Um, the one thing I, I feel at this poem, um, and it's something that we think about a lot more than we used to, but it feels like the telling of someone else's poem. And, um, and which is, I think, you know, some people don't refuse, I, think, I can't remember who we were talking to on the Rattlecast, but just recently we were talking about somebody who they never write someone else's poem and always make sure that it's their poem, uh, like their story to tell. And if you're, maybe it was Katie Porter. Yeah, I think it was Katie Porter. But, um, but like, if you're present, it's your story too. Um, but if it's just someone else's story, then some people feel hesitant to, to tell, you know, speak for other people. And this poem kind of does that. Um, which I think, um, you know, personally, I think it's fine, but a lot of people, you know, it's a very mixed opinion about, about whether or not that's a good thing to do. But the interesting thing in this poem is I felt like the teacher, um, as the speaker was missing. So we have, um, in this section down here, where is it? Yeah. So he jumps up, nods in reverse, down, then up with a jaw, winking and winking at teacher knowingly because he is one. Um, so the teacher is like the observer, it feels like. Um, but the teacher is is told in such a passive way. And what I wanted to do with this poem is insert the teacher a little bit as a witness. Um, you know, make it in first person and tell that story of the student. It's, it's a sort of missing a level of like personal emotional connection. Um, and I think that can be added because the teacher is a witness, which is sort of like a proxy for us as the reader, which is a witness of what's going on. And so if we could, I, th I, would, I would switch this poem, you know, I would tighten it up a little bit, make it a little shorter, and focus on the best part, uh, which is this part right here for sure. But then I would, I would frame it in, in the first person, I think, 
and tell it a little bit more through the eyes of the teacher just so we get to feel. Yeah, so Kelly Rush says, um, it can feel presumptuous to write someone else's poem, but I didn't get that feeling much here. And yeah, yeah, so Joe Barker says too, yes, how do you tell someone's story that is not your own? That's a great question. It is. It's a real conundrum, you know, um, especially when we have projects like Prisoner Express um, and, and uh, you know, people could tell their own story. It's not like nobody, you know, poetry is an amazing thing where everybody has access. Um, I I don't know. So so I think it's it's a it's a problem that we're not going to solve here on the critique of the week but it just happened to coincidentally at the same time i think i think the poem would be a little stronger if we got it from the teacher's perspective um and so it doesn't really matter what you think about that topic it sort of it kills two birds with one stone to put it in the first person a little bit so that the the teacher is the witness and then we get to connect through the witness and that lets us connect to the poem a little bit more um, also gets rid of that that sort of criticism um which I, I, it depends what you want to do with criticism. That's always an interesting thing too, because if, um, I mean, maybe you want to say, you know, screw that and I can write whatever I want, which is fine, but then you'll turn off a chunk of the potential readers of it. Um, and so that's something to consider. Like, is it worth, um, you know, is it worth turning people off who don't like that? You know, is there something else in the poem that's, that's, I don't know, do you sacrifice anything by not upsetting people through those kind of um, contemporary um, problems that we see, you know? And if you don't lose anything by not upsetting people in that way, you might as well not. So so there's two reasons, I think, to get into the first person. Um, but but in general, I think the poem would be better anyway. So, so, you know, so on entry day, you just put an eye a little bit here. Um, you know, have the eye witnessing this a little bit. Like, I think this, you know, instead of the passive way that the mugshot screams uh, from his school badge, like a snitch, like, like I'm making this, um, you know, I'm interpreting it this way. And then we would, we would feel like we're observing it and we feel like the speaker is a part of it. Um, and we know where we are sort of positioned within the poem too. I think it, I think that would add a layer of, of strength to the poem, but it's not, it's a good poem anyway. Um, I like this little anecdote that it tells. Um, Let's see. So Karen Marcus has totally agree on adding uh, the teacher as a witness. Uh, she also says maybe you should spell out juvenile offender rather than just use J-O, which was down there. Yeah, I think I agree because I didn't know what this was either. So I was a little confused. Um, let's see. Tom Barlow says chewing on the last passage. Don't get it yet. Um, and that last passage is here. Understanding irony and conundrum has killed what's left of reason today. Something to celebrate inside. Something to celebrate. Which I think, just if you repeat things, the, the sense of repeating things is just a little melodramatic. Um, but but it's, um, how did Nate Jacob put it? Nate Jacob explained it over here. Um, he said, uh, the, the iron and conundrum are killers of reason. Um, and yeah, it, it's like, um, like like the reason, it's hard to explain. So the reason, but but I like it too, it fits. Because the, the reason, it's the reason he was here. So that's his reason for being in prison. Like this is what reason is. It's the reason that he was in, in prison. And then he, he wants to get rid of his reason. Like, that's the whole, that's what's going on in the poem. Maybe I should elaborate a little bit. So so he's trying to flick the reasons to forget the, the bad thing that he did, you know? Um, and he flicks it over here to this boy here. And then they, you have to pick it up at the office. And, you know, it's just, it's sort of something like, like, and I wonder if maybe we could do more with that too, where um, that's one thought I had that I didn't say out loud, is that I wonder if we could personify that reason a little more, like it's actually like sitting on his shoulder or, or sitting on a, like a hat. Like, like imagine it as like more of a physical object even than this, and that might make that aspect a little stronger. But anyway, he's trying to get rid of this reason, um, the thing that he did wrong, you know, and trying to like be a, be a person again, be a human being or be a boy, you know, or, or whatever. So, um, so it's the, the humor, the, the funniness of this, and the irony of it in the, the predicament he's in. Like all these things sort of combine into forgetting 
what the reason that he's there um, was. Like everybody kind of forgets. And I think that was what the the story is telling in this poem. Um, but yeah, so I wonder, so, so I would sort of do two things. Like I could really imagine, I think this poem is great. Like what the story it tells is wonderful. I can imagine um, it just being so much better even though. Um, if we, we imagine this, the scene, like we are the teacher, right? The speaker's the teacher. He walks in the room with his mugshot and the actual reason is sort of like actually on his shoulder or something or like hovering behind him and he's flicking it away. But we actually describe that. Like I can see it as the teacher from that teacher's point of view. Um, and then the whole story plays out like that. Um, and just, just that aspect becomes really vivid and it's through the teacher's eyes so that we get, so I think that would be a great poem if we, if we sort of revise it in that direction. So that would be my, my suggestion. Um, let's see. Yeah, Tom Barlow he puts it a great way here. He says, there's an obvious sympathy for the boy and that sympathy must reside in the narrator. So I agree bringing this frame forward. Yeah. Okay. So I think we've we figured out this poem. I, a very good poem. I, I enjoyed it um, and definitely worth making even better. So so let's work on that. Uh, but thanks for sharing that, Annie. And then we have a second poem by Annie Wilcox. This is The Bourgeois Pig. Let me take a cup of coffee. I, need a, I haven't gotten my coffee kick yet. Okay, The Bourgeois Pig. The Bourgeois Pig is small and dimly lit. Light falls in selected places. The liquor glows warmly from it. Yellow, gold, tobacco, brown. Bottle after bottle line the walls in curvy, tempting shapes. The coffee is delicious and dark like the patrons. College students order Turkish coffee from a tall brass and glass brewer. It felt like Europe, and I felt twenty-something swaying by the crowded doorway, drinking in the sounds of a twenty-something boy. My date speaks of going back to Europe some day, and I vow silently not to go with him. He has a pot belly, and I and couldn't find his opinion if he tried. We smoke cigarettes and stroll down Mass Street. I give a twenty to a gray-haired Choctaw who only asks for a one. Buy food and go to AA, I say. His watery blue eyes look into mine like they see something familiar. He lowers the cardboard sign the longer we talk. I want to take his hand and show him the hem of my skirt. Get drunk with him at the bourgeois pig, for God's sake, and remember Europe as if we'd been there together. Oh, this is interesting, too. So I think, um, in general, Annie uh, has a great sense of description and explaining and like setting us in a scene, which we saw in both these poems. So I feel, especially this opening section, I really feel there. I think it's a great description of this bar. The bourgeois pig is small and dimly lit. Um, light falls in select, pl select places. The liquor glows warmly from it yellow gold. I kind of wanted it to be a that rhyme to carry through. I was kind of hoping it was a formal poem. Uh, maybe that's just my mood lately, though. Yellow gold, tobacco brown, bottle after bottle on the walls and curvy, tempting shapes. The coffee is delicious and dark like the patrons. College students order Turkish coffee from a tall brass and glass brewer. I wonder if the glass and brass is necessary it's a little bit a little trippy just to say um the brass and glass brewer it's the there's something about the um the bees with the rhyme in between that that and to my tongue trips it up a little bit and i don't know if it's necessary i think a tall bra bla a tall brass brewer is um enough of an image of, of the turkish coffee so maybe i'd cut the glass maybe not though it's up to you it felt like europe and i felt 20 something swing so this made me wonder um you know how old now um, like, I, I guess I, I, maybe I wanted the word again, um, because I, I guess what it is, is I, I felt 20 something could either mean I felt like I'm young again, or it could mean I felt like I'm actually my age. Like I could be 20. Um, and now I actually feel like I'm 20, you know? So there's that sense where I'm not sure which it was. Um, so if, if, if the speaker, if the narrator is older, I wouldn't add again. Um, just to, um, to to clarify that ambiguity, because I, I was a little confused about that spot. And then, and then once you have that, um, 
um, once you have that sort of ambiguity that you're confused about, you, you can't help your your brain just can't help trying to resolve that. But you're sort of living in this Schrodinger's cat world where the the narrator becomes both older and younger at the same time. And then when you get to a line like twenty something boy, you don't know if your date is younger than you, or if you're just both twenty something, which changes the whole sort of dynamic of the scene too. You know, and so there should be a way to like let us know how old you know i am and with respect to this line somehow um swaying by the crowded doorway drinking in the sounds of a 20 something boy and and is is the 20 something boy my date i was confused about that so there's some ambiguities here that i'm i'm a little having a little trouble resolving just just specific detail and you don't want people to get lost in specific details that don't matter you know you want to make sure that that kind of stuff that just sort of basic surrounding thing is pretty clear because otherwise we get lost in it and then we don't we can't extract the meaning and the feeling out of the poem if we're we're confused by those type things my date speaks of going back to europe someday and i vow silently not to go with him his pot belly he has a pot belly and couldn't find his opinion if he tried um that's kind of a funny line we smoke cigarettes and stroll down Mass Street. I gave a 20 to a gray-haired Choctaw who only asked for a one. Hmm. Yeah, so Deborah T says, I thought the 20-something boy wasn't the date, but it's not clear. Yeah, that, I think it's not. Yeah, so it's hard to... Um... Yeah, Jimmy Pappas loves the pot belly line. Yeah, I wonder... The, the, I thought the pot belly line was great. And I would I would like a little bit more um, connection to the physical, like you know how if you have a pot belly you almost like can't see the numbers on a scale, like that's how I'm kind of imagining it. Like he's like looking around, but his his belly's in the way for his opinion for his opinion. But I think that could be drawn out a little bit better even. Um, so I don't know. I think maybe you could expand on this with an image, um, you know, make that a little bit more obvious. Um, or just more powerful of an image by ex- describing that a, a little bit. Um, Tom Barlow says that it shift between present and past tense. Does it? I didn't notice if it did. Let's see. A lot of times when that happens, it's because it's a revision. Let's see. So the pot belly is, is small and dimly lit. The liquor flows so we were present, present. Coffee is delicious. College students order Turkish coffee. It felt like Europe. Yeah, yeah, good point. So this um, this is probably the felt, the... Um, that's the wrong tense. It's past tense, and the rest of the poem is in present. Let's see. So, Deborah, see about this pot belly line. I think it's very interesting because you um. I don't know. So, so Dick Westheimer says, yes, I saw that without being drawn out. The pot belly was all I needed. Um, Deborah T says, I was put off by the pot belly, which is something that we should um, mention too, I think, and couldn't find an opinion line. Maybe that's just me, though. Um, yeah, I think, hmm, I don't know. I would like it drawn out a little bit. I would like a little bit of a, a little bit more of that visual. Terry R says, if the date isn't the 20 something boy, which I thought also thought was the case, then why are the sounds of the 20-something boy even in the poem? Yeah, so yeah, so there's just a lot of little ambiguity here that, that makes it a little hard to follow. And, and also we get this, um, you know, my date speaks of going back to Europe someday, and I vow silently not to go with him, which almost seems like the heart of the poem, like the point, like my, like the dissatisfaction with the date here and the day and and why wouldn't you want to go back to Europe with this person that kind of feels like the heart of the poem and yet it's 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 we breeze by it really quickly um yeah so so I don't know so I feel like maybe we could expand on this a little bit and maybe again it's a case of putting more of the the eye in here like we get this great description but it's a, it's a very distant, like I'm just explaining the bar until the eye shows up here. It felt like Europe. Um, but maybe we could draw out, just show a little bit of scene between the date and the speaker 
and then we get more of a sense of like what's actually going on. I think maybe that's what's missing. That's what I mean by like put more eye like around here, just expand. Like once you get the great description, you, you sort of painted the stage and we have the setting and then let a little bit happen maybe before, um, before the date speaks about Europe and then we transition out. Um, hmm. We smoke cigarettes and stroll down Mass Street. Um, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like we don't, we're not just getting a lot out of the relationship thing. So I stroll, I, we smoke cigarettes, or we smoke cigarettes and stroll down Mass Street. Like, this is given two lines. But really, like, what 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 happens here? Um, like, I mean, it's the kind of amount of content that, that could be like a transition to more. But, but down Mass Street, is that really worth like a line in the poem? Um, it, it kind of feels like like right here is a blank space for more description. We smoke cigarettes and stroll down Mass Street. He says blah blah blah, and I say blah blah blah, or, or like his face looks like this, or you know some kind of thing where we get more out of this little relationship before we move on. I feel like we're just rushing through that. Um, it's just not very. It's not made very vivid. Um, but then we move on again. I give a twenty to a gray-haired Choctaw who only asked for a one. Buy food and go to AA, I say. Um, I don't know. And maybe this is just me. But in this line, I'm always like, they're not going to buy food and go to AA, you know? Um, so I don't know if, um, like, I don't know how seriously to take that line when it, when a narrator says that. Do they not realize that that's not going to happen? Um, or is it just like a wink to the fact that it's not going to happen? I don't know. Um, his watery blue eyes look into mine like they see something familiar. He lowers the cardboard sign the longer we wa we talk. And so here too, um, you know, the longer we talk, it, it, you know, we have this tiny, like here, have a 20 and go to AA, that one statement. But we have this implied kind of conversation because the longer we talk, like we're still, t but we don't get to see that. And I wonder if, um, e you know, even if... Um, one great piece of advice about dialogue, and I still have Janet Fitch's book, which I haven't given back to my friend who I borrowed it from, but I took a fiction class with Janet Fitch, and she said to use as little dialogue as possible. If anything can be paraphrased, paraphrase. And I think that's great advice, and you see that good writers do that usually. And um, and so I think you could paraphrase what the conversation is about, but I'd like to know a little bit about what the conversation is about. Um, and, and yeah, so... Um, And Jimmy Papa says, how does she know the gray-haired person is a Choctaw? Um, there's a bit of mean-spiritedness in the poem, he says. And Terry R., this business with the Choctaw gets a little into that same discomfort with telling another person's story. There's some kind of subtle self-congratulatory tone that is put off. Yeah, that's the thing that's going on here. I was hoping someone would say it. Um, that it just feels like a little, you know, patting myself on the back type and a little judgmental in a way when it's not trying to. Um, so I think the way that this, this whole section just doesn't feel off. It feels, I guess, one of the reasons I want more of the conversation is to sort of make, make this person a human. Um, almost the person feels a little bit like a prop in the poem. Um, Nate Jacobs is, am I correct? So this is a different interpretation, um, than I had, um, but Nate Jacobs says, am I correct that this poem is about figuring out who the pig is? The narrator is not terribly kind. And that could be. Um, that's an interesting interpretation. Um, and Deborah T says, yes, the mean-spirited is what bothers me up at the, up at the pot belly comment. That's interesting. So if that is the case, it, it is, um, I could definitely see that. And I like the, I love the title if that's the case. And that's the whole poem is supposed to be ironic. Like the, the narrator thinks she's like a good person, but really isn't. Um, I'm not sure that's the sense of it though. So I think it's kind of, it's, it's kind of um, lost in between the two ends of the spectrum. Um, I could see it being intended either way. Um... Jimmy Papa says maybe the speaker should be a bit self-deprecating. Perhaps the ending corrects some of the mean-spiritedness. That's the thing. So, so as I was reading it, I was wondering if that might be the case. But then at the end, 
um, it sort of you know changes. There's a shift there. Yeah. So Nate Jacobs says, uh, I don't really know what it that it was intended by the poet, but the narrator isn't especially likable for me. Yeah, and I didn't think that was in, yeah I didn't think that was intentional. But not, but once you say that the title is the bourgeois pig, I think that's kind of nice. So I don't know, I mean, but maybe that's just too a little too subtle. Hmm. I don't know. Very interesting. But I don't know how to in interpret the poem um, between those two kind of poles. What does... Um... So Katie Dozier Mushman says, I think it is meant to be ironic with the name and the action to the beggar. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. So so Deborah e. Martin says, um, the poet likes the man on the street more than her date. I think that's the point. Bernard Hask says, who cares if the narrator is mean-spirited? Um, yeah, it's just how to, like, like, what is the point of this poem? Why are we reading it, and what are we getting out of it? And if you don't know how, um, you know, which way to go with the, with the poem, um, like it, there, there's several like different interesting poems that it could be, but it feels to me like it's kind of all of them at once, um, in, in a way that just doesn't work again, like that Schrodinger's cat type thing again, um, but on a d bigger scale. So it could be this like question of who is the pig, which is the interesting thing. Um, or it could sort of go in one direction or the other. Um, Joe Becker says it's the point to be edgy. I'm not sure. I just don't know how to interpret it. Um, hmm. So I guess the, the, the main thing is clarity, I think. You know, I don't know what I, what I come away with here. The descriptions are good. I love the title. Um, but I'm not sure what's going on in the poem. So Francine Witt's interpretation is that she thinks um, her date is a bourgeois pig and likes the guy on the street better. Kimberly McNeil says, I'm lost. So so we're all just lost. And I, I don't know either. I mean, my my interpretation originally was that the date was a bourgeois pig and I like the guy on the street better, like Francine Witt says. Um, but then once Nate Jacob points out that that, that could be ironic and, and a, a, a twist and like really the narrator's the pig, um, I like that interpretation of the poem, but I don't see that that in the structure of the poem itself. I think that may be the most interesting way the poem go, could go about. Um, yeah, I think the bourgeois pig is the name of the bar, for for sure, and Fronte who asked. Uh, that, was, that was what I think it is. But also, you know, um, what's that word? Where the, the setting describes the characters that, like, Thomas Hardy did all the time? I can't remember what that's called. Um, there's some fancy literary major word for it. Um, Tom Barlow says the role of alcohol is woven through and wonders if this is a poem about the narrator's struggle with it um, Dick, Bar uh, Dick Westheimer says uh, I felt like the narrator was revealing their complexity that they were being honest about their imperfections that could be too I don't know it just exists in this kind of um, this limbo where we don't know what to make of anything but but not in a like certain poems can work where you, where the whole point is that you don't exactly know what to make of anything, which would be my favorite way to go about this poem, I think, where where the ambiguity is like on the surface and like we're supposed to not know. But here it feels like we should know, but we don't know where to go with it. I think that's the, the issue with this poem. Um, but yeah, Deborah, she says, yes, to recommend AA and then imagine drinking with him. Um, yeah, so this poem is a poem that feels kind of lost, I would say. Um, but we have to move on. It's it's oh man, it's nine forty already. I just love just going over poems like this though. It's fun. I, I always I never go through fast enough. But let's move on. Um, this is Jesse um, Cease. It's it's uh, pronounced Cease. He says. So um, let's see. Okay, so here is shirt love and shirt pockets by Jesse Cease. A plumb line dies from your heart to mine. You measure what I've buried, not treasure, but a thing kept secret, a thing with wings, a thing I've guarded that buzzes like a hive, a stitched wound, a bird whose only plumes are sterile threads. And now you threaten peril, 
to untie my sutures, to examine what's inside, to survey the chambers of my heart, to weigh its sinew and muscle, to diagram its rooms. You'll see it all, the glory, the grime, the grit. But you stay and slip the sketch you made of my heart's dimensions into your shirt pocket and slip your little hand into my hand and pull me with a smile down the street. Very interesting. So I, th- I love the sounds of this poem, too. Um, and I love the ending. There's a transition there that's nice. So love in shirt pockets. A plumb line dives from your heart to mine. Um, and, you know, we always have to be a little careful about the hearts and wonder if, if there's going to... You know, speaking of, you know, things that turn people off, like um, telling someone else a story, um, there are a lot of things that just you have to sort of realize that just seeing them is going to turn some readers off and, and you have to decide if you care. <laughs> and, um, so, and just hearts is one of them. Like a lot of people, Oh God, hearts, as soon as they get to that line and maybe even skip the poem. So you have to kind of be aware of that. Um, hopefully, you know, if a poem is published in some, I mean, that's kind of one of the things that, uh, curating a, a magazine does or, or a book, but a publisher is that like, this is worth reading, we're saying. And so get over that, but, but not everybody is going to. So that's one thing you um, should be aware of. A plumb line dies from your heart to mine. I think that's fine. I, I, it doesn't bother me. Um, but but it is, you know, you have to think about it carefully if you're going to use hearts um, and a lot of other things. You measure what I've buried, not treasure, but a thing kept secret, a thing with wings, a thing I've guarded that buzzes like a hive. It's just beautiful, beautiful uh, rhythms in language there. A stitched wound, a bird who's only, I love the wound and plumes, a bird who's only plumes are sterile threads. And now you threaten peril to untie my sutures, to examine what's inside, to survey the chambers of my heart. We get the heart again. Um, and I would probably uh, skip the heart there, maybe. Well, no, because the whole thing's a diagram of the heart, so that's fine. To weigh its sinew and muscle, to diagram its rooms. You'll see it all, the glory, the grime, the grit. I feel like this, the glory, the grime, the grit is a little abstract, and there's a spot right here. I don't know if it's... I don't know. This is something that, that I didn't always, like a, a sense almost, I didn't always have. But at some point in writing poems and reading a lot of submissions, I can just feel these holes in the poem where more wants to be described. And you, you see it all, the glory, the grime, the grit. And then it just wants, the, like the poem wants to describe the, the picture a little more right here. Can you feel that? Or is that just me? Um, You know, the glory, the grime, the grit, the the... You know, how could you describe like the tissue itself and like a way we could see and feel? It feels like that wants to be inserted into that spot. Like it feels like we're left hanging in a way that th- there's just this opportunity to to stretch that image out and, and make us feel and connect with it a little more. And so I think it wants the poem wants one more line right here, expanding on the goal, glory, grime and grit and making it a little more tangible um, and, and vivid. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but. But you stay um, and slip the sketch you made of my heart's dimensions into your shirt. Um, and so still, through the whole poem, um, I'm still thinking like romantic love poem type things. Because you get the heart, you know, and the heart from mine and all this stuff. And so when um, you slip the sketch you made of my heart's dimensions into your shirt pocket and slip your little hand, and it's only a little hand where we realize it's a child, um, you slip your little hand into my, my into my hand and pull me with a smile down the street. I just love great turn there. I just love, you know, it, it's sort of a setup. You know, it's sort of like a trick almost. Like, hey, th- you know, it's this way, and then oh no, it's this way. But that does actually work. Like, it makes the the sweetness of that moment um, be pulled out by contrast. Um, that it wasn't the same kind of feeling that we originally thought. Um, makes the feeling that we're trying to share here a little more, just feel more real and powerful, I think. So I think it works really well. I like the structure of the poem. Um, and I think this is just a good poem. Let's see. Yeah, so Nate Jacobs says, finding it to be about a child is the twist that makes it work for me. Yeah, exactly. Um <laughs> Uh, Josh Weems says, I've got one hand in my pocket and the other is causing a cardiovascular event. That's nice. Um, let's see. Yeah, Kimberly McNeil says, nice lyrical rhythm. 
Um, Katie Dozier Mushman says American sonnets are the best sonnets. That is the one problem. I out of my corner of my eye, I believe this is 14 lines. I didn't count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, forty. Yeah. Um, so if you did um, add more after the grit, I think it's worth keeping it in a as an American sonnet form. So um, so you'd have to like you know pack that in a little bit. Um. But but it's always good to have to pack things in. Like I, I always think about the David Kirby was talking about um how he uses the shape of the poems to just force him to make decisions and that and that makes you, you know, kill your darlings to have to pack things into a certain shape. And it ends up making um making the poem stronger just by having that forced like Sophie's choice, you know? And so so adding having to try to pack an extra line without losing the fourteen line length is I think a good exercise. So I think maybe I would I would try that um let's see yeah i'm not sure if i have any other suggestions though i think it's pretty good um yeah jimmy papa says the hearts and stuff are red flags words but it is worth it yeah like there's a reason for using them and if, there, if you have a reason for using anything like do it um, Dix Westheimer says she talked more about the holes. I don't know. I just there's there's a way that you can sort of feel that there's opportunity being missed, um, and it's in the rhythm too. I always wonder. I guess what I wonder when I see this because it happens so much in poems, where you're like almost excited for the the continuation of the description or or whatever, or and then it moves on. And you can sort of feel like that that something was missing. I always wonder if it was something that was cut in like a revision. And I'm sensing like the loss because it, it feels like there's something in the rhythm too a lot of the time, you know. And so it really has so much to do with the rhythm and not even the detail of it. So like there's something about the way that that line's moving. You'll see it all, the glory, the grime, the grit, the blah, 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 blah. Like there's a sense that you, that there's, there's more that's like coming. There's a way that like the, the syntax that you're using and the rhythm that's set up almost like predicts what's coming next or like is generating what's coming next. And it feels like there's something there just so often. And then there's not, um, and I do. I never know if it's something that, like, I can hear the revision process in the rhythm and the syntax, or if it's if it's more about what the poem could be and what's missing. You know, like what could be added, and you can just sort of imagine what could be added. I'm not sure. It's something I've always wondered about. I don't really understand. But if you, as we do these critiques, I, you know, you'll see I point these things out. Like, there's a spot where there there could be more, and and we sort of want more as readers. Um, Deborah T says, I like rereading this poem. It keeps giving me more. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like, you know, one thing, I think it's a good poem. And so it's tough for me to um, um, have a lot of suggestions about it. This one line, I think I would like some more detail there. I think the title could do better. Um, that's one thing that sort of doesn't live up to it. And I will go back to, I just love this exercise. It was Kim Stafford who said this in a Rattlecast, but when he's trying to title a poem, he does a title that's descriptive, then he does a title that's long, then he does a title that's weird. So he makes himself write three titles that are very different, and then he picks the one he likes the most. He says usually it's the weird one, and you have, but you have to do it in that order, and, um, and, and it's just a way to draw out the way the title-making process into an actual process where it's like generating something, because people have trouble with titles, I think. And Love in Shirt Pockets... Um, I don't know. It doesn't add a whole lot. It doesn't, it doesn't make me feel anything. It doesn't make me really curious to read the poem. Um, so I don't know. I think generating a better title would help this poem a lot because it's a good poem. I like it already. Um, let's see. I think that might be my only advice though. Like add a little bit there, tighten up to, to keep it 14 lines, even though you add a little bit. And uh, fix the title. Let's see. Oh, Nate Jacobs said the same thing probably before I did. I'm not entirely sold on the title, but I do like the poem. Um, Sharon Frenti said, uh, yes, I would change that title to In My Shirt Pocket. 
Um, Cindy Putnam Guntherman says maybe it is a non-custodial dad and his child. Nate Jacobs says Love and Rockets was a marginal alternative band in the 80s. So when you go through titles for this, the, the you have to remember, though, keep in mind that the poem is working because it's sort of tricking us. It's a trap poem. You know, it's getting us to think one way. Um, we're thinking one way about the relationship. And then it turns out to be the sweet you know, child parent relationship. And so you don't want to give that away in the title. Um, so, so the title is going to be really tricky. I, I think I would play with a lot of like just generating titles and seeing what, what works. Like, um, you know, the Kim Stafford technique is cool, but maybe there could be, there's other ways you could generate, just, you know, iterate and make a bunch of titles and then see what is interesting. Cause I think the title doesn't, the poem, the title doesn't live up to the poem, which I think is pretty good. Um, okay, let's move on to the next poem, I think, unless someone has some, okay, let's move on to the next poem. And this is Getting a Grip. Again, we're looking at uh, poems by Jesse Cease. Getting a Grip. A gripe spawned in my mind and started wreaking havoc, pulling my poetry books off the shelves, and before I got a good grip on it, it knocked over more than a few of my favorite writing chairs. Why do I have so many chairs in here? It's rarely as roomy in here as a Parisian loft with windows that reach all the way up to 15-foot ceilings. Mostly it's a rabbit warren, thick and dark with life. But every time a gripe shows up, my mind turns into a mid-century mansion with dozens of dusty, draped-off rooms for it to hide in and no less than six staircases spiraling off in six different directions, three of which would have you headache or give you headache just thinking about where they lead. Chasing down a gripe is exhausting, but it's nothing like hunting a worry. The last worry that snuck in turned my mind into a single room, but huge, the size of a football field, and mostly empty, except for a few Lego bricks, two by sixes mostly. You'd think, it, you'd think it'd be easy to find a worry in there, but don't forget they're totally black and the room has no lights or windows. I've spent days groping around after worry. Thankfully, they make that little noise every time they move. You know, like a fork tine scraping a plate. I think it's their bones. It's the only way you can catch one. Sit quietly and listen. But I was telling you about this gripe and how I finally caught it. I had gotten stuck ha it had gotten stuck half under my bed, probably hoping to attack while I slept. But I snuck up on the devious, the devious little thing. Dragging it out by its hind leg, I chucked the squirming ball of fluff out the third-story window. I know it'll be back, or some other awful creature will, but for now, things are quiet. I can enjoy my coffee in peace and put all my poetry books back on the shelves. This is a very interesting poem. Um, I love the personification, especially toward later where we pick up the, um, the worry and the empty black room. That's really cool. I love that personification. Um, so getting a grip, that's an interesting, um, you know, sort of pun on the on the cliched phrase or the, the um, idiom, getting a grip, because um, we're actually getting a grip, a grip on the gripe. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. So I kind of actually like the title. It's, it's kind of clever. A gripe spawned in my mind and started wrecking havoc. Yeah, so I don't know if I said reeking or wrecking. It's actually, I mean, the... The phrase is usually wreaking havoc. So I'm not sure if that's a twist on wreaking havoc and it's intentional or if it's just a typo. Um, one of the things, if it's not clear, this is a, a modern thing that I wish wasn't the case. But, um, but if it's not clear, if you're just being clever in a way that looks like it could be a typo, readers will assume it's a typo <laughs> because there's so many typos these days. So we had a poem. Um, it was um, um, Gene Hall Gailey's. Um, poem way back in, I don't know, 15 years ago. And um, there's a line. So so um, Jean was being sort of clever and funny throughout the whole poem. And um, at one point she says, um, sign a happy tune instead of sing a happy tune. And it makes sense within the context. I, I, it's not worth showing you the whole poem, but you can look it up. It's a Janine Hall Gailey uh, poem from, I don't know, 2005 or so. Um, but anyway, all of our proofreaders like circled. It's like, hey, that's a typo. And I was like, no, it's not. We'll just leave it. And then I got like, a whole bunch of people emailing me when the poem was online saying, oh, there's a typo in line. Like, everybody thinks it's a typo because the world is full of typos. Like, we have this era, you know, where we're not 
carefully, you know, the, the admission cost for words is so low that we're not carefully copy editing anymore. And so if you have something that's like gimmicky, you know, like a twist on, on words, a play on words that's, that's typo based, people just assume you made a mistake. And I think that might be what happened here. Um, wrecking havoc instead of wreaking havoc. Um, but I'm not sure. So I would not do that just because of that that reason. It's kind of unfortunate. You wish people had more of confidence in uh, editors, <laughs> but we have proven ourselves to um, not deserve the confidence. Um, and, and I'm not a fan of the phrase wreaking havoc just in general, because it's always like you can't really, like it's a cliched type phrase, but there's really no way to use those words without wreaking havoc for some reason. Like it's like they're so wed together. And for some reason, that's always annoyed me. So I don't know. Um, I would maybe try to just use a, to- a totally different verb and like like try to inject some newness to havoc, <laughs> so it's not not tied to reeking. Um. Anyway, and before I got a good grip on it, it knocked over more than a few of my favorite writing chairs. Why do I have so many writing chairs in here? This aside. Um, it's the only aside in the poem, and I'm not sure if it's worthy of an, being the only aside in the poem. Like, I think if you, um, um, I don't know, I, I think maybe I would just get rid of the, and let it be part of the voice and not have it be an aside that strongly. Um, hmm, I don't know. But why do I have so many chairs in here? It's, it's still interesting, though. It's rarely as roomy as it is in here. And that's a defect in the paper. That's not a crumb that I spilled. Don't worry. Um, it's rarely as roomy in here. And it's funny. Like you notice um, papers are, are much more um, full of flaws than you notice when you have them on the screen here. It's rarely as roomy in here as a Parisian loft with windows that reach all the way up to 15 foot ceilings. Mostly it's raven worn, thick and dark with life. So I, for the whole poem... I love the worry personification, and it felt like that was almost more the point. Um, yeah. Um, Jimmy Pappas, don't mention the, the wreaking havoc. Um, she says, just use an active verb to describe pulling the books off the shelf in a hasty fashion. Skip wreaking havoc, which is a cliche. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So just find find something better. Um, but anyway... I feel like the heart of the poem, which we haven't got to in a second, read through slowly, is the worry part. And I think it, I feel like I get, especially knowing that, like knowing how much I'm going to like the worry, I'm a little bit getting bored with the gripe. So I think I would probably tighten this up and, and, and get to, um, get to the, the worry a little bit faster, maybe. Um, cause, cause I think the, the gripe description is not as good as the worry description. It's rarely, let's see, where do we go? Mostly it's rabbit worn, thick and dark with life. But every time a gripe shows up, my mind turns into mid-century mansion with dozens of dusty, draped-off rooms for it to hide in and no less than six staircases spiraling off in different directions, three of which would give you a headache just thinking about where they lead. I think th- this is the kind of thing, I think I would probably, I like the, I like the mind sort of expanding into mansions and the draped-off rooms is very vivid with the dust. Um, in the six spiraling staircases, I think the three, when I say like go get to the the worry quicker, I think I would cut like the, I would cut these lines. Um, you know, like that that's extent, it's the opposite of that hole from, from the last poem. I think it's going too far with that image and we don't need it. Like we can just move on after the six, like we've, we've described this mid-century mansion, which is very vivid and, and interesting. We've described it plenty. We don't need three of them to give us a headache thinking about where they lead. I think we can get a headache already on our own. Um, let's see. So chasing down a gripe is exhausting, but it's nothing like hunting a worry. And this is, a, I feel like this is the heart. The worry is, 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 is cool. So, so we, then we go, so it's framed around the gripe, which is just really interesting. The last worry snuck in, that snuck in, turned my mind into a single room, but huge, the size of a football field. I think we're missing some, um, I think there's little typos here, which I just kind of roll over as I'm reading, but we're missing an A, the size of a football field and mostly empty, except for a few Lego bricks, two by sixes mostly. I think there's no, 
should not be a hyphen there. I mean, not a hyphen. Uh, <laughs> what are those called? An apostrophe. Um, you'd think it'd be easy to, f- you'd think it would. See, and again, I think I think we're missing a would there. you think it would. Well, you can't even read that. Would be easy. That's You can tell it says would, right? You'd think it would be easy to find a worry in there. But don't forget they're totally black and the room has no lights or windows. I've spent days groping around after worry. Um, T- Terry R. says, could the poem, um, could you start the poem with chasing down a gripe? Um, and yeah, I think, um, I don't know, I, I like the frame of it. And I, I like the way that we sort of show two examples so I think it works. I think I just tighten it a little bit, like get a little bit quicker um, to the worry is, is all I'd say. Um, you think it would be easy to find a worry in there, but don't forget they're totally black and the room has no lights or windows. It's such a great description. I've spent days groping around after worry. That's such a great line. Like a lot of times great lines are um, really simple lines. And that right there, I've spent days groping around after worry. Like who, you know, how much, what a great figurative language that is, even though it's so simple. Thankfully, they make that little noise every time they move, you know, like a fork tine scraping a plate. I think it's their bones. I just love, I mean, just love that, that um, you know, not personification, but like almost personification. You know, like a fork tine scraping a plate. I think it's their bones. It's the way you can catch one, sit quietly and listen. But I was telling you about this gripe, how I finally caught it. I had gotten It had gotten stuck half under my bed, probably hoping to attack while I slept. That one I'm not sure. Attack while I slept. So the, the thing where these work really well is where they can be metaphors for how the thing works. Can a, How does a gripe attack when you sleep? I guess in your dreams? Maybe that's just what it means, that it's attacking in your dreams. But I snuck up on the devious little thing, dragging it out by its hind leg. I chucked the squirming ball of fluff. Here, there's a little bit of a run of like, I did this, I did this, I did this. The I snuck, I chucked, I know. Um, And I think that mixing that up, just the way it's described and, you know, the way the sentence structure is would would help a little bit in this little section right here. Um, It had gotten stuck half under my bed. So yeah, we have the how I finally caught it. It had gotten stuck half under my bed, probably hoping to attack while I slept. But I snuck up on the devious little thing, dragging it out by its hind legs. Um, I chucked the squirming thing, or squirming ball of fluff out the third story window. I know it'll be back, or some other awful creature will, but for now, things are quiet. I can enjoy my coffee in peace and put all of my poetry books back on the shelves. I don't know. I think it's a fun story. I like the poem. Um... Yeah, Jimmy Papa says, I tend not to be an ING person. And me too. There, there's just something about the way um, though that verb conjugation, um, it, it's a, the same sound just comes over and over and over again. Um, and it's a whole, it's a whole um, stress syllable usually. And so it's a very, it's a very prominent form of conjugation, which is not something you think of very often, but just audibly. Um, the ing, it's just you hear that repetition over and over again, and it's a little off-putting. Which, and so I tend not to be an ing person either, just like Jimmy Pappas just said. And so I would try to restructure things around not using that because you get just in these runs of it. It's almost, um, it feels, it's almost distracting in the same way that if you have a um, justified text and you get the white gaps that kind of flow down the page, um, that can be distracting. Just, it's almost like an irritation in your vision and, and the ing's over and over again are almost an irritation in your ear um susan tally says there's a bit of a dr zeus um perhaps from a prior critique and maybe could be played with interesting let's go to um facebook francine witt says i've heard it called inging <laughs> yeah inging really it just stands out so much um, Joe Bucker says mid-century modern is the hot phrase that's funny um, Sharon Frentis says I like fi- I finally caught it good ending <laughs> 
And Katie uh, Dozier says, uh, mid-century reference um, takes me to mid. Oh, let's keep jumping. Takes me to mid-century style. I think is at odds with the rest of the mansion, but that's probably because I'm an interior design dork. That's funny. Um, um, Kimberly McNeil says, end it. Listen. Where was the listen? Things are quiet now. I can enjoy my coffee in peace and put all my poetry books back on the shelves. Oh, I think she might be, um, I think Kimberly McNeil might be behind. That was the last poem, or two poems ago. And Nate Jacobs says, how is gripe a ball of fluff? Not how I would think of it. It's, it kind of gets caught in your throat. It's kind of how I was imagining it. Or maybe I would think of it more as like a like a sea urchin or something. Um, like spiny. But anyway. Um, yeah, this is an interesting poem. I like the way it's told. I like the shape of it. You know, I like the to- storytelling progression. The height of it to me is the um, it's just the description of the worry and like hunting down the worry. And I think maybe we could turn up, just, just since Nate Jacob mentioned it, um, I think maybe we could turn up the description of the gripe so it like lives up to the description of the worry, like fits as a, um, as a, um, you know, figurative language for what a gripe would do to you a little better. And so it becomes a little more vivid. Maybe that's something I would play with, with this poem. Um, let's see. Tom Barlow says peeve is a funny, funny synonym to gripe. That's interesting. Um, Deborah T says the ending left me wanting to know what it, the gripe was. I was waiting for some of the big reveal. I kind of like that there was no reveal. I like that it's like personified or anthro or not. What's the word? What was the word for like anthropomorphized but into an animal? Anim, anim, animatized? Animized? I don't know. Um, but I like that the that the emotion and the the thing that bugs you is like an animal, um, and I like that we don't actually know what it is. I actually like that aspect of it. Um, Deborah T says, uh, as with the previous poet, whatever problems it might have, this poet's got chops. So yeah, these are these are fun. Both these are really good poems. All four have been good poems today, and I think that's going to wrap up the show. So, um, um. Yeah, so we looked at uh, getting a gripe. Um, this is Jesse Cease. Um, and then Love in Shirt Pockets. I would change the title, uh, but otherwise, this is a really good poem, also by Jesse Cease. Kind of American sonnet that twists at the end. Um, the Bourgeois Pig is the most confusing poem of the day, and I think it just needs to be clarified a little bit. Um, that was uh, Annie Wilcox. And then this nice portrait of a prisoner, too. So good poems uh, throughout. Uh, a, lot of, lots of, a lot of meat to sink your teeth into. Thanks for sharing these uh, to Annie and Jesse. And um, that is going to be the show for today. Now, um, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be Linda Nemec Foster. Um, she's the author of a whole bunch of books. The Blue Divide is the most recent. Uh, we'll be talking to her. It's going to be a lot of fun. That is Rattlecast number 157. The uh, prompt for this week was to... Oh, I, I have to look it up. I don't remember. The prompt was to... Prompt was to. I'm just stalling. The prompt was to write a poem about every place you've ever lived, how it felt to be there, what made that place different or special, beautiful or terrible, what did you see or eat there, how did it smell, what did you pass on your way home, and that was the prompt uh, provided by Elizabeth S. Wolf on last week's Rattlecast. That is one of the prompts that she gave to the Poets in the Prisoner Express project. So you'll you know do a poem like they did. Um, I think. One or two of the poems that we read on um, the show last week were from that prompt. So that is your prompt for this week. Write a poem about a pl- every place you've ever lived somehow. Um, see what you can do with that. And then we'll talk to Linda Nemec Foster. Right cast number 157. The regular time, Monday, August 29th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great weekend in the meantime. And I will talk to you later. Goodbye.